After weeks and weeks, uh, after months and months and months of buildup and hype and anticipation, and not just exclusively, but primarily in your boxer shorts, AEW, Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019, 8 p.m. Eastern, live on TNT from the capital of Omega in Washington, D.C. AEW presents Dynamite! Boom! Goes the dynamite. And what you had to be hoping is that after all this buildup, that this show wasn't going to be like a lot of your sex lives. And I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you actually have a sex life, so take that as a compliment. Whereas there's all this excitement and all this buildup and all this anticipation, and then kind of like dynamite, boom, there was an explosion. And ultimately afterwards, everybody feels a long and continuing feeling of disappointment. Now for me, it is safe to say that I didn't get that out of this debut premiere episode of Dynamite. Still don't know if I'm a fan of the name or not, but I wasn't expecting overwhelming awesome. I was not. And, and I didn't get that anyways. I wasn't expecting it to totally be a crap show. I expected it somewhere to be kind of in the middle. Um, and, then, and that's kind of what I got here, which was okay, which was okay. Sometimes the most important thing is not to totally and completely crap the bed, but then sometimes you say, you only get one chance to make a first impression, you might as well make the best impression you possibly can. So did they do that? Did they not do that? You know, regardless of my opinion or any of yours, we don't know. Only time will actually truly tell. But let's talk about this week's show. First thing that kind of warmed the cackles of my heart a little bit was getting to hear and see JR and Tony freaking Shivani on commentary. I'm going to throw on Excalibur. That was great. Took me back to the glory days of the late 90s. Took me back to when a night like Wednesday night happened every single week on Monday night and you had far more people invested in both WWF and WCW, and the shows were better, and the characters were better, the stories were better, the twists and the turns were better, all of it was better. 2019 is like a kind of sort of remedial version of it, where you've got a brand new company going up against the major company's number three show. It's about the best you're going to get here with wrestling in 2019, so we've got to take it as it is. One thing I will point out about the commentary... One of them's got to go more heelish. Three guys kind of working all on the same side of the fence is kind of pointless. And whether it be Excalibur or hope to swear to God, it's condescending ass Tony Schiavone, somebody's got to turn heel on that commentary team, I'm just saying. But let's talk about the actual show. The first ever match. It's going to be a trivia question someday. In all elite wrestling dynamite history, who are the participants? Of course it was Cody Rhodes and Sammy Guevara. Now, let me be clear. It makes sense for Cody Rhodes to be in this spot, not just because he's an EVP of the company, because he's one of the more recognizable names on the brand. So as a result, he's been out there doing the promotion for this company for many months. He's got a family name that is very recognizable. Obviously, you're also talking about a guy who has years of exposure on WWE TV, you'd put him in this spot. Sammy Guevara, eh, not so much. What really frustrated me more about it is, why the hell is he giving Guevara so much? At least I will say this, is that eventually these guys caught on as the match was going on because the crowd was awesome, especially early on in the night, pretty much throughout the entire show. But especially here at the beginning, they were so hot for whatever was going to happen. If you don't have to do a bunch of dumb crap to pop the crowd, then don't. Go basic. And they didn't go all the way basic, but at least they didn't go too far overboard. Just as the match was getting to my eyes to be a little too long, they ended it. I thought the finish is kind of a dud. Cody should have been a little more dominant, and it should have ended five minutes before. But nonetheless, the highlight of this 
was Chris Jericho coming out and whooping up on Cody Rose. Would have been nice to be able to see more of it. But at these key critical moments, you're cutting away to split screen commercials. I understand you've got to pay the bills. And I understand all of that. But there are other moments in time in the show where you probably could sit there and do the split screen commercials. When your world champion is attacking the top contender at full gear on the pay-per-view next month, probably not the right time to do so. But nonetheless, I digress. Moving on. Botchin Brandon Cutler. <laughs> he sucks. Oh, right, here they come. Sammy Guevara is a great wrestler. He totally deserved this guy. You're trying to get young talent over. Oh, screw you. Brandon Cutler is an outstanding professional wrestler, and he totally deserved this spot. He just had an accident. No, he's done forever. He sucks. And if anything, he gave me a highlight of the night. That's for damn sure. The only bad thing about it is how dare dumbass, botching ass Brandon Klutzler sit there and be smirch. And bring down in any way the primetime dynamite debut of one Maxwell Jacob Friedman MJF. How dare you, sir? How dare you? MJF actually embraces being a heel. MJF actually wants to be hated. That is so damn refreshing. At least here is a guy that is trying to be a character. And this is something that this company is going to need. For all of the neckbeards and the raging nerds that are going to talk about match quality, it is not match quality that is going to make the difference for this company in its long-term sustainability, success, and viability and growth. It is going to be characters and stories, period. Period. The in-ring action is a component of that. It is a storytelling device. It is not what the be-all and end-all should be. So when I see somebody like MJL, I say, hey, you know what? In the land of vanilla midgets, you actually got somebody that gives a crap. I can actually get over the way the hell you should. Just saying, it's nice. Oh, I know you had Jalen, Jalen freaking Silent Bob there or whatever. Felt like some old WCW crap, and that's okay. At least trying to give themselves some credibility real time in the show. Trying to sit there and give themselves some type of notoriety utilizing names and faces that are there. No real issue with that whatsoever. Um, you know, private party and Angelico and Jack Evans, whatever. Whatever. But made sense to put those guys on there. What was disappointing to me, though, was when they did this little tag team promo segment. You got SA, SCU and you got the Lucha Brothers and all of this. It just reminded me of one thing. Where the hell was the Luchasaurus on this damn show? We need to get a whack. And don't give me that crap of he's going to be on next week or a week after that. The point of the matter is, here's this big six foot five fucking motherfucker wearing a damn fucking lucha mask called the freaking Luchasaurus. Somebody that gets over tremendously well with the crowd. And you don't give him run. You don't give him tick on your debut premiere show. That is ludicrous. And ridiculous. Who's booking this crap? But I'll survive. Pac versus Hangman Page. Yeah, this was the type of match that really kind of drove home to me uh, the little bit of the shortcomings with the commentary team. Tell us more about why Pac is a bastard. Tell us more about what makes him the bastard. Tell us more about why people should hate him or why he is so legitimate. Tell us more about Hangman Page. There's kind of that element of a little bit of presumptiveness and a little bit of almost arrogance of, well, you tuned into the product. You must know who these guys are. And the reality is no people that were tuning in didn't necessarily know who the hell these guys were. There's a morbid curiosity with this new wrestling company where Chris Jericho is the champion and they've got JR and freaking Tony Schiavone. And Cody Rhodes is there, like, tuning in to see what they're about. Tell us a little more about these characters, please. It's a good match, but again, it's not just about the matches. It's not just about the in-ring action. And frankly, it was kind of a common theme throughout the night. 
A lot about in-ring action, not a lot of actual character development truly, or a lot of real storytelling, or a lot of building and creating stories. And again, some of you are going to come back at me and say, well, this is the first show, how much of you did they expect? A little bit more, frankly, than what we got. A little bit more. Which brings us to this AEW Women's World Championship match, Riho and Nyla Rose. And I look at this match very simply. It is an abortion to my sensibilities and basic logic that Rio is wrestling a fucking 50-50 match with this fucking big, beefy bitch, Nyla Rose. Now, some of you are going to say, well, there's a reason she's big and beefy. I'm not even going to get into all that. I will get into this, though. You have two paths that you could go down. You could sit there and both appease the SJWs and piss off other people, which means that you actually generate some heat, generate some controversy, which might actually, for God's sakes, get you some damn cash and put the freaking strap on Nyla Rose. Or you could surprise people with, oh my God, they actually went there with the character and the wrestler that's not nearly as big of a deal, that is not going to generate controversy, that's not going to draw you a ton of money in Rio. So guess what AEW went with? A lot of people, I think, really enjoyed this match. I did not. I just didn't. I thought the match had sloppy moments. The match lacked a lot of believability in terms of how it was booked. You can have much smaller versus much bigger and tell a really, really good story, and we did not get that here. We just did not. You know, the one botch where Rio top, jumps on top of Nyla Rose and fucks it up, you know, that certainly didn't help. The finish was lame. That just that belt for the women looks stupid. It looks amateurish by comparison to the world title, which I think actually does look good. I just was not a fan of this. The flow and structure of the match, eh. Another long match, eh. Instead of going with the person that might actually generate some heat, on one side of the fence or the other, potentially both, and generate some interest where people are going to tune in to see, you went the other lame-ass direction. And then the stuff afterwards, oh, Kenny Omega comes out. So yes, he trained her, he wrestled her when she was nine years old. What do you, the, the real premise that I'm getting at here when I'm talking about it on social media during the night, during the damn show, is what the fuck are you building up to? Are you building up to a Kenny Omega versus Nyla Rose match? Are you going down the intergender path? Oh, some of you shut up. Don't go there. I know what you're going to say. Bottom line is, y'all had Britt Baker, and they were actually doing a good job with the commentary, actually trying to tell her story about how long it took her to become a dentist and all of this stuff. You know, why isn't she running out interfering? Why isn't she trying to help? Just always got to be a fucking about the elite, doesn't it? We'll see how much that remains a theme. The main event, though. I enjoyed a lot. It had very little to actually do with the match. The reality is, I don't remember much of anything about that damn match. It wasn't a typical flippy fuck fest that involves the Bucks of Suck like you would typically expect to see based off of their history and pedigree. But the reality is, is even if it was, I don't remember. Because a few minutes in, here comes John Moxley creeping up behind Kenny Omega. And then they go off and do their damn thing for a few minutes. All the way to the point where you got Omega going through the damn table, even though Moxley's the one that took most of the damn butt. And it's like, you know what? This kind of shocking moment, this is freaking cool. The hell with the match. You're trying to set up a feud. You're trying to set up an angle. You're trying to tell a story with these two guys. Now, that is something I can get invested in. That is something that I want to see. And then later on in the night... As the match goes on, the match wins, Team Jericho wins, hip hip hooray, who gives a crap. And out comes Dustin as Cody's getting beat up. And then here comes the old American from America, Mr. Brothers himself, Jake Hager. And as much as I've enjoyed ripping on Jack Swagger over the years, in this time in WWE, Mr. Two minutes to unhook the Money in the Bank briefcase of WrestleMania ass. What I will say is this. In a different place, in a different time, around different people, Hager looked menacing. Hager looked like a monster. Hager looked like that dude. 
I thought this appearance, this surprise debut was incredibly well done. I loved a lot about this main event in part because it mostly minimized the Young Bucks. Bonus for me. Yeah, the world champion, Chris Jericho, smelling, up, smelling like roses, winning the match, freaking helping beat up on his contender. That's cool. The Moxley Omega stuff was pretty good. And then Jake Hager coming out, looking legit, looking like the type of dude with his undefeated streak in freaking Bellator MMA, whatever the hell. You know, now he comes in with some legit, legit, real fighting chops. He looked in a land of kind of misfit toys and midgets. He looked like a freak. He looked like a monster. And that was something that really stood out to me on the screen. And that's something in that type of finish that could stand out to others that are watching for the first time. And if anything else, if anything else, the biggest thing that that main event did for me was it gave me a reason to tune in and watch next week. Whereas so often, when you talk about Raw, talk about SmackDown, doesn't matter. You don't have a cliffhanger. You don't have anything to incentivize you to tune in the next week. You're just doing it out of happenstance and circumstance and habit. Here, you'll want to tune in next week to see why the hell Jake Hager came out like he did. Why the hell did he attack Cody like he did? Why the hell is he in AEW? What's going to happen next with Moxley and Omega? If they did more of the show like this and set up more things like this, they're going to be in pretty good shape. But at least I can say, with some of the ups and downs of the show throughout the night, damn, that main event had me. And, and that I appreciated. I was rewarded for my two hours of watching them. Now, overall thoughts on the show. Here are some of the positives. Obviously, the next day when the viewership numbers came out, and they did 1.4 million viewers and did very strongly, I think over 800,000 in the key demo. They almost did as much in the key demo as NXT did, period. That's a good debut. That's a really good, strong debut. Where I was expecting, like, best case scenario, maybe a million to 1.1 million viewers doing 1.4 million viewers? It's a good start. What happens in terms of if that's your peak or you build off of that will determine just how impressive that number is long term. But at least they could say for one night, one week, they beat NXT handily, handily, and they drew enough of a number where you have to at least take them somewhat seriously. Somewhat seriously. Again, a big positive. I loved the main event and the different layers of complexity kind of going with that dusty, almost Crash TV Russo type of finish. You kind of need that. We don't just need it match, 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 match throughout the course of the night. I love the fact that MJF was given mic time and he made the most of it. Being a character is more important than being a great in-ring technician. Also, the show... The crowd was incredibly hot throughout the night. It looked well lit. It looked big league. It felt big league. For a new company, that's an incredibly important thing to have. Some of the stuff from a production standpoint I could knock, but those are things sometimes you try and you fail and you make mistakes and grew, move, move down and grow from it. But they had some good things here. What didn't I like though, or what are things that feel like AEW should work on going forward? Number one, do a better job of introducing these characters, assuming that you have new viewers catching your product for the first time. you got to educate us on who these people are, what makes them tick, and why we should care about them. Period. Period. You have to do a better job of that. And we also have to start seeing a buildup of more actual stories. You know, when you look at this, how many real stories did you build up here? If it wasn't something really involving the elite guys, it didn't matter. Like Cody clearly was taken care of here throughout the night. Omega was taken care of here throughout the night. And that was pretty much it. On a night where it's your first ever show, you would expect to see more than two angles really be built up. But that's all you got. Now, if you come back next week and you do more, cool. But right now... This is just a lot of wrestling. 
And that's another thing. Where a lot of you are going to sit there and say, Oh my God, how can you say a wrestling show is too much wrestling? Because when wrestling is out about its best, and it's at its best, it's not about the damn in-ring action alone, exclusively, or even primarily. This company has to figure out a way to both still appeal to their hardcore fans, or shouldn't be abandoning them anyways, and try to grow their product and get new bot eyeballs, get new fans to check them out and build an audience there and build brand loyalty. And one way to not do that is to slog your show down with a bunch of lengthy matches. Mix it up, give us some variety. Even with Botch and Brandon Cutler's dumbass, at least I could say for that match with MJF, it was like three and a half, four minutes. That's why it stood out a little bit outside of the match was the fact that it was shorter and all the other matches on the show got a length of time. They got some run. And when you do too much of the 50-50 stuff, nobody really gets over. Nobody really stands out. MJF is over a lot more because of the type of match that he had and how quickly he was able to win than a Cody Rhodes is for struggling against a nobody like Sammy Guevara or a Pac beating a hangman page. You get what I'm saying here? I mean, we gotta gotta work on that a little bit. Um, also, the biggest issue I had with this week was some of the timing of the commercial breaks and how poorly they were fit into the show and the flow of the show at times and how awkward it was. And you got big key signature moments happening and you're cutting away to where people can't really see it. Again, I understand you have to pay the bills, but you gotta figure out better places and times to interject that stuff or build your show around those commercial breaks. It's the reality of what you do now. Now in the Bush Leagues, you're trying to hang and kick in the Major Leagues. Got to figure out a way to really hang in the Major Leagues. Um, overall, I won't say I was surprised or super impressed or anything like that. I just thought it was an okay show with a really, really good ending. It's about what I expected to get out of this premiere debut episode of Dynamite. I didn't think I was going to see a ton of character development or a ton of storylines uh, begin, and I didn't. So I wasn't disappointed there. That's about what I expected. I expected most of the matches to go long, and in some cases maybe too long, and I got that. At least I got enough throughout the course of the night to make me feel like my time was justified. The company is justified with the decent rating and viewership that they had for their first week. But they cannot be complacent. They cannot think that this means that they're any good. This must be only viewed as a building block and a path forward to a bigger and larger audience. So if we start trashing on NXT and WWE and talking about how you kicked their ass and everything else, then that's just making you feel Bush League and Minor League your damn selves. Because even in that case, when you look at what AEW and NXT did combined, they still were doing around what Raw would do in the viewership. So did they really generate new interest? Did they really bring in new fans? I don't know. But it was an okay night. It was a fun night. And when it comes to wrestling nowadays, I can stand to have a little fun once in a while. So I'll take it.